for those uh, who don't know me, uh, my name's Stephen Horn, and uh, I work as a, a licensed lay minister uh, down in Kent, um, which I've got an interesting story for someone I met today, actually. Um, and, uh, and also do similar lectures to this um, different parts of the country, usually uh, within different universities and theological college settings. Um, that's really my CV, that's not really me. So I'm, uh, I'm a father of six children. Um, yep, I can feel the deep shared intake of breath there. Thank you, that is a five-a-side and a substitute. So, um, <laughs> Um, and uh, and a, uh, an owner of a wonderful little border terrier who's uh, brought much joy into our life as well as birds, twigs and everything else you can imagine. It's fine. I'm learning to live with a dog and it's great. Um, so yeah, as I said, there was uh, just a, a little story today. Well, this is the second time I've been to Liverpool. The first time was very uh, short-lived. It was actually only for one day. It's something completely different. So this is my first I'll go, say, proper time in Liverpool. And I've arrived at the station earlier on. Um, I've given now an estimated time when I'd arrive. And actually my train somehow um, turned up early, which is kind of unheard of. So I had a few minutes to myself. And I thought rather than, uh, rather than give Evan a call and uh, you know, say, oh, I, I'm here, I'll, I'll just spend, you know, in the next 15 minutes, have a little wander around. I like to get to a bit of a feel for a place. And um, uh, train stations can be wonderful places, to tell you that sometimes, because you can see if someone's trying to get into that train station quickly, they probably don't want to stay in the city, and that'll tell you what you need to know, whereas if they're coming out quickly the other way. Anyway, so I get, I get talking to this, uh, this guy on the, the steps. So is it Lime Street Station, I think? So, so you've got the, the, the big steps, and I've come out, you've got the grand big building on the right-hand side, having a little look. And uh, I think the guy clocked on that I might be, I might be new to the area. And so uh, we, he, he, he just starts talking. I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation, but it did buck the trend. Like I said, I'm from Kent, which is obviously south of London, where, generally speaking, if we're on public transport or near it, we don't smile at each other and we don't look at it. You have a very different way of doing things up this end of the country so he's talking to me and inevitably it got to the question of you know oh okay so are you red or blue I was fully aware of the city I'm in and I'm thinking if you keep me talking any longer because this guy could really talk um, I don't know if he's clocked the colour of my beard but I'm going to be both blue and red at the same time so anyway that's enough of that but it's a wonderful city and I've been blessed by everyone I've uh, met and as, uh, as Ellen said it's um uh, you know, we, we've met um, about a year ago, and, uh, and I've met uh, Louis and Mirab and a couple of others, and everyone has just been so, so welcoming. So first of all, I just want to say, you know, a big, big thank you. Thanks where, where it's due. But um, what a privilege to be uh, here in such a beautiful building uh, among such wonderful company. Um, it's been a pretty full-on 18 months or so. Um, uh, and more, more recently so since, uh, since my book was released. So I, I forget exactly again exactly what point we, um, Ellen and I uh, first met. Um, it's been a, a lot of online um, chats here and there, um, but it's been wonderful um, sharing that same passion uh, for the, you know, bringing hope to the lost, the last and the least. And, uh, and it's, it's encouraging to be here. Um, I want to give you a very quick uh, background context uh, to my new book, Gypsies and Jesus, A Traveller Theology, which unsurprisingly informs some of what I'll share with you uh, this evening. Uh, also, if I may, uh, I want to spend just a minute or two running through a couple of questions regarding certain themes that have come up quite a few times in recent in interviews. Now, I know we'll have a few, you know, a bit of Q&A afterwards, uh, but it's just really to give you a bit of a flavour, um, you know, perhaps where we're coming from on different things. And also, I know what happens on these things is someone say, I've, you have a question in your head and you might be thinking about that and then the rest of the lecture kind of, you know, goes wayward. So, uh, um, and of course, I, I have tried to summarise these questions, um, but the idea is to give you a slight taster of the book. So, Gypsies and Jesus, uh, Traveller Theology, um, has in the practical sense uh, been in the offing for actually just under a decade, uh, namely through my doctoral research that I completed just under two years ago. However, if God's encouraged and inspired even just one word in the book, then I believe that the message, per se, has been waiting in the wings, um, has been waiting in the wings long before it was placed in my heart. On one hand, the book's original and a revelatory insight into contemporary GRT, or 
gypsy, Roma and traveller, uh, religiosity and spirituality. However, more broadly, um, my aims for the book is to inform and encourage both GRT people and non-GRT people of all faiths and none. Uh, to place God firmly as the translator and mediator between, uh, between the cultures and to demonstrate how a traveller theology can work as a way of practice and thought for everyone regardless of race and ethnicity. So why haven't we heard of a traveller theology until now? Now, there is a decent amount of literature out there that talks of gypsy, Roma and traveller religion. However, the overwhelming majority of said literature, if you're familiar with certain works, um, most is written by non-GRT people. And whilst that isn't an issue in and of itself at all, particularly where objective research is concerned, such li literature can be limited and is often self-serving. So it does very little in that sense in the way of empowering and amplifying its marginalised subjects. Conversely, the reasoning as to why, relatively speaking, there isn't much written about faith by GRT people is twofold. So firstly, historically, GRT people just simply haven't been given the same opportunities as other people when it comes to being able to write their own history. Uh, secondly, GRT communities have traditionally been identified as holding an oral culture, uh, meaning that history, knowledge, values, traditions and education have typically been shared through practice and word of mouth. And as such, these factors have meant that in the past, writings on faith by GRT people has often been either short in length and content, usually because you know publishers aren't willing to produce uh, material by those communities, and subjective to the uh, community it's originated from um, and has been remotely and independently produced. So a quick example would be um, some so certain small literature works that I've got that was produced by a pastor uh, in southern Spain, and that was purely about the community that he was in, so rather than being more broad and encompassing, it was just for that one community. As probably expected, uh, when you're attempting to compile for the first time a distinct and working coherent theology representative of an, of an entire people group, that one, you're only going to be able to scratch the surface. Two, you're going to have to limit or compress certain themes and tropes, which, if my publisher is listening, means there's way more books I can write. Um, three, not everyone is going to agree with you, which I think it's fair to say that would be the case with any theology. Um, and four, there's always going to be lots of questions. We'll wait till the end. Uh, and whilst I'm sure that there will be time for questions afterwards, um, here are a couple, again, as I mentioned, that will relate to a couple of specific themes that arise in the book. So excuse me for a moment. I'm just going to essentially interview myself briefly. So gypsies and travellers have historically been associated in different forms to nomadic lifestyles and or movement. How does nomadism and, and or impermanence relate to and influence GRT spirituality? Quite a deep question. Thank you, Steve. I'll try and answer it. Um, nomadism and impermanence relate to and influence everyone's spirituality, whether they realise it or not, everyone's. Traveller theology merely emphasises it like it places the microphone on them. It places the tropes of nomadism and impermanence in central positions of our faith. Faith, life, our values, and even our bodies are permanently impermanent, always moving and always changing. From dust we come, and to dust we shall return. And I will compete with that organ. There we go. The door's yeah. shut as well, Steve. I'm taking it as something atmospheric. It feels like I'm building to a much bigger point, and I really don't want to let people down. So if the, if, the, if the tone changes, just go with it. Yet so often we become entrenched in sp uh, specific political and religious thought and practice. We become embedded in it and stagnant even. And we act as if we are going to live forever. We settle for all that today has to offer us because we wholeheartedly believe that tomorrow will always come. But these approaches are in stark opposition to the reality of our condition, physical and spiritual. You see, consciously or otherwise, GRT spirituality bucks this trend. Turns to, quote, spinal tap, if you're familiar with it, turns life up to 11, and physically enacting the uh, nomadic nature that the creator has pl placed at the heart of all of its creation. Next question. At times, the book discusses the sometimes clear separation between GRT communities and settled communities. And to explain some parts of this, I introduced the idea of the edge lens. 
What is the significance of the Edgelands to GRT theology? So the Edgelands is where others reside. I use that in quotations. Where others reside, where undesirables are kept, where thoughts contra contrary to the mainstream are placed, where separation is maintained. Ever since their emergence into Europe, GRT people have been kept physically, socially, politically and educationally to the margins of a wider and general society. Have you ever noticed how most uh, gypsy and traveller camps are usually on the outskirts of cities and towns or in the most undesirable places, near tips and on, in car parks, where they can remain unnoticed? Jesus spent most of his ministry in the Edgelands spending time ministering to those whom society deemed unfit and unworthy. And significantly, though, Jesus also created his own edgelands, spending time alone in prayer and even dying on the edgelands of the cross. When I discuss the idea of edgelands in my book, I want people to see how often they are both called to pay attention to and walk alongside the marginalised and ostracised who occupy those edgelands in our societies and how they are to maintain the sanctity of the boundaries within their own edgelands of prayer, virtue, and walk of faith. And finally, the concept of purity, as if you've started reading the book, uh, appears central to GRT faith. Can you summarize its importance? Yes, I can, Steve. So the idea of what purity and what it entails in GRT culture has, has evolved a great deal from community health, such as keeping washing and cooking separate. Uh, when early Roma people were on the uh, diaspora from 10th century India to 14th century Europe, to more modern times where uh, ideas around purity can look like men and women sitting separately at social events, not engaging in sex before marriage, and perhaps even using different crockery for gypsies and non-gypsies alike. Um, its place within GRT faith has unsurprisingly merged with traditional values and cultural practice and as such the almost universal current of purity that runs through GRT faith is pivotal. You know, so it's probably something we'll pick up on later. Okay, I want to take you back a little over 10 years ago. I'd never been so excited to fill out an application form before. And the usual bore, writing down your work history, personal details and educational record actually seemed like weightless tasks as I completed each line and letter with almost with a smile. You see, this was my application to attend university as a mature student. I'd served on the thin blue line, I'd led missions in Europe and beyond, I'd had a beautiful, I had a beautiful and growing family, but this felt like real tangible change, a new start, something God led. I'd grown up in abject poverty in a single parent household where the only thing between myself and the cruelty of a world that didn't care for people like me uh, was the indomitable will of a strong mother. University wasn't a word that I actually heard of until about 15 years old and not something I understood until about the age of 20 when in the middle of a training exercise uh, my sergeant with some randomness decided to tell me in the most frustrated and sarcastic tone about how when he studied for his degree and how he wished that some of those around him had either stayed at uni and not wasted his time or that they'd spent their time learning to make a decent brew. So, um, that was my first plug for, for uni. Uh, I'd never imagined I'd be uh, applying to go somewhere that at the same time seemed so alien. But here I was and there it was the part of every application that some people causes many concerns. How would you describe your race and ethnicity? Apparently, inconvenient and subject to racism isn't an option, but many really wish it was. Take, for example, GRT, again, Gypsies, Roman Travellers. The promise on these forms of privacy and zero discrimination doesn't wash when you've inherited a thousand years of marginalisation and hostility from the protectors of your well, the rulers, the religious institutes, the health and educational bo uh, bodies, or your neighbours even. I paused and I considered my options. See, I had mixed parentage, so I went with a parent who had always been there, my mother. White British it was then. Phew, that's got to be safe, right? Little did I know, within a couple of years, I would teach countless teachers and others about the, their discrimination, about the discrimination and hostility faced by GRT people and their relatively unknown history, and where their earlier concern about what box to tick would be a distant memory. So why start the annual Micah lecture with that story? 
Well, in many ways, it's an origin story, something that gives us a glimpse into the past so that we might better understand the present. And in other ways, it's a step further, a contextual story, something that looks at someone else's account with a view to not only understanding the present, but sowing a seed that might grow into future change. And perhaps the most famous for this latter style of storytelling was Jesus. So his stories or parables, uh, parables were prophetic. Parables enabled the opportunity to position, for people to be able to position their own humanity alongside characters and situations that they'd heard about. And in turn, they could reflect and enable change. You see, parables are prophetic, but they are not prophecies. They are glimpses into what, we, what might be and how we as individuals might personally deal with those future things. Whereas prophecies, the like of which Micah delivered, are warnings of future outcomes with the occasional get-out clause and offers of divine hope. I think then that if we're going to explore a traveller theology in the context of the prophetic standing of Micah and the Micah lecture and the tangible, tangible surroundings of this glorious building, then we need both a story that we can reflect on and an assessment that we can repent from. What do you think? You good with that? Cool. Okay. Right. So we can we can ditch the script for a moment. <laughs> Sorry, I'm cool with that. Incidentally, just as a side point, I very much dislike reading from things, but you know when you want to cover certain points, so that's that's for other people's benefit and not mine. So do excuse me on that. Um, obviously, can't see you on the camera, um, but is anyone here familiar with the children's BBC program Horrible Histories? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, thank goodness for that. I had to explain it at the last lecture. It didn't go down well. Anyway, this is so we know about horrible Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so um, going to run through for a few minutes. Essentially, a horrible history's introduction to GRT history and GRT church origins. If that's okay with you. Cool. Okay. So we're going to go back, we're, we're going to do this in some kind of order, so we're going to start with one. If you're not great with your geography, don't worry, I'll run you through it. Uh, never the intro, we were on Western India, and we're starting off point one there. So Western India, just over a thousand years ago, uh, we've got what we call proto uh, Rome or proto Roma, uh, which is essentially the very, very early Roma people. So I'm not going to go into all the different definitions and separations of what makes someone gypsy, what makes someone Roma, what makes someone traveller. Um, I, we can talk about that, but I'd like to get stuck into the, you know, some of the other details this evening, if that's okay with you. So, but what you need to know is that originally this people group displaced from India because of, because of different wars going on and different, um, um, essentially sort of civil wars is the, probably the best way to summarise that, going on within the continent at that particular time, led to a huge exodus of a large group of people who would then travel or make their way over a long period of time from India and across what we would essentially uh, know as something along the lines of the Silk, the silk Route, the Silk Road, um, towards the Middle East and ending up at point number two. So uh, that's in, in modern day times, it's known as Methany. Uh, That's probably not the right pronunciation on that. But originally, it was uh, Modon, uh, which is in southern Greece. It's a bottleneck kind of port town. And it used to be somewhere where uh, lots of different traders would meet. But more importantly, and specific for our story here, is that it was also a key point on pilgrimages for people going, you probably from England, different parts of Europe, and were travelling to the Holy Land. And so you had different religious groups passing both ways and ending up in this bottleneck area. And so now we get our first introduction to um, essentially Roma people experiencing, um, well, they would have experienced some form of racism along the way, but in terms of the way that we would understand it, in terms of that kind of labelling and that, um, that sort of descriptive uh, racism. So, this pe large people group would end up at Metheny, Modon. And because there was a large amount of people, they would, for, you know, they were within the community. They couldn't settle within what was essentially a small port town. So they would settle on the outskirts. And so we see this trend of Roma people living on the outskirts or being forced to live on the outskirts of cities from the very start. 
And this was inaffectionately known as Little Egypt. And the reason why it was known as Little Egypt is because the people coming through had dark skin and wore brightly coloured clothing, okay, like the Egyptian traders that were coming across. Of course, we understand this as actually because it would have been things like people wearing saris. And, uh, so she suddenly realised that you know, there was actually an ignorance, but it was an intentional ignorance. Um, incidentally by Europeans. I won't mention it specifically Germans, we won't go there. Mm. Um, but it was, uh, so th it was ineffectually known as Little, uh, as Little Egypt, and so the people were then called Egyptians. Of course, what's the uh, Greek for Egyptians? It was Gypsios, and that Greek means Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxonified, if that's even a term, and so we get from Gypsos, we get Gypsy. So you've got Roma, you've got Gypsy. Okay, and this is why uh, many Roma, and particularly many Roma in Europe, um, don't want to be called uh, gypsy. It's, it's offensive, you know, and, and th there's lots of reasons for that, and, but there's always connotations behind it as well. It's not just an issue of semantics. People have lived and died based on what they're identifying as. So excuses for a bit of a crude term, but you understand, you know, obviously what, where we're sort of coming from on that. So, so we've got Roma, but we've also got gypsies. So, moving on, I've done bullet points because honestly we'll just be here for another three or four hours. So then we get our journey into Europe. This time uh, in Modon, uh, it's important to note that there's, again, they're fleeing essentially what is civil wars. Wars going on in the Middle East. And so there's coming a crushing point. We've got Islamic armies and we've got Christian armies. And so this people group who are already fleeing war are trying to then move on. Whilst they're in Modon, as a way of, I guess, survival, um, being able to blend in with others, which gypsies and travellers have had to do f for a thousand years, um, they would adopt Christianity. And so with Christianity, they would then make their way into Europe. Uh, and they would actually use these papal letters, letters from the, being issued on behalf of the Catholic Church, to be able to get safe passage. But importantly, those letters said that these people could never settle. They won't, you're not allowed to reside in a land you can pass through safe passage and churches are obliged to help them out but you don't have to let them settle and it seems like it's been a curse that's lasted ever since now it, some of you might be clocked on to something already if it sounds familiar that there's a big war particularly civil war going on in the middle eastern country and that that big war caused an entire exodus of people to have to flee and make their way through Europe to escape persecution only to find themselves into the hands of nations that just wanted to cause as much persecution or demonization through their different press or through their um, through their political systems then you would be right in thinking hang on a second didn't this all wasn't this happening in 2014 2015 16 and still happening now history has a very bad way of repeating itself and again when we ignore the past we're doomed to repeat it it seems so we have this journey into europe and we have the arrival into uh sorry if this is quite uk centric but we have the the entrance into england and scotland around about the late 1400s official date is 1506 but of course we know that by the time you've got an official date it's because um people have started getting noticed so you know they, they would have been there for quite some time before that then, uh, a lip special mention, not because he shares the same colour beard as me, but we're going to mention Henry VIII, because um, he has some kind of big impact on kind of what's going on. Now, for most of us, when we think of Henry VIII, if you cast your mind back now, okay, so you're back at school, and what's the mnemonic? Was it divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived? Yeah, we, we all know that. We have this wonderful little cheering the mnemonic so we can think about you know oh, I was a terrible guy but we'll just have a little cheerful thing he brought something in called the Egyptian Act 1530 and the Egyptian Act 1530 outlawed uh, gypsies which sounds an odd thing when you're talking about a, an, a distinct ethnicity a, a distinct race how do you make it outlawed well King Henry VIII did uh, and by 1556 it was uh, you could be served capital punishment for being a gypsy or an Egyptian so a slightly different, uh, slightly different outtake there. If you're perhaps a, you know, a young gypsy or traveller um, at school and you're doing your history and you know your history, you might have a different take on the, you know, some of the lessons that you were experiencing in school. But with that capital punishment also came other punishments that were familiar for those who were, who were on the margins and found themselves in Europe. Slavery and the slave trade. 
Um, if any of you have been familiar with the Ghastly programme, and I hate that the fact we still mention it now, um, My Big Fat Gypsy Wedding, there was an American version of that as well. So we have Roman, we have gypsies in America. And how is that so? Because they were sent to plantations as well. Because they were less than, they weren't considered people because of the Egyptian Act. And then of course we have the witch hunts. So it, there's, and this was done because based on the alleged superstition that you know, many uh, gypsies were purported to be you know, enacting. Um, we're going to skip forward to the 18th century, uh, 19th century, so now we're on, we're definitely in step four here, okay? I forgot, I had numbers behind me, there we go. Um, this is when the church steps in. Hurrah, except it wasn't an, a, a real, it wasn't exactly like they wanted to. It was more a case of we had this real distinct separation between church and state, and it was really becoming evident now. It's 1800s, we've got, you know, the Industrial Revolution happening, and the, the church are uh, essentially having to find like a new identity really and be, you know, solidify something so you can hold some kind of control. And the government recognised it. And uh, again, this is a horrible history one, so don't necessarily quote me word for word on this. Um, and so in, with the church, they stepped in and were essentially given the task of looking after the heathens as they've been described. Um, these lesser than, these vagabonds, um, gypsies. And uh, we did have some good interventions. The Salvation Army was the first, um, first church body to actually step in and provide education and, and fix shelter for, uh, for gypsy communities. Um, we do have some well-known gypsies as well. There's uh, someone called Rodney Smith. He's known as Rodney Gypsy Smith. Um, probably the most, most people haven't heard of him, but I mean, that tells you kind of all you need to know. But he was probably the most famous uh, gypsy preacher that there was. However, even with him, as much as his, his ministry had a great impact and he travelled around the world, he went to the Americas, he went everywhere around the world and was able to, you know, um, have a great ministry. You would, it's not unheard of to have big posters up on walls. In fact, I've seen one that was <coughs> excuse me, printed in New York which had said, come and hear the gypsy preach. And it was about... It was about him because he was a gypsy. It was done like a carnival, so you really had that Victorian carnival vibe because he was a gypsy. Um, then it goes quiet for a bit. Then we get the uh, we get World War Two. Uh, the Prorajmos. Uh, there's different pronunciations, and again, it's probably I'm probably still uh, getting that wrong. But the Prorajmos, which is the genocide of at, at least five hundred thousand. Roma and Gypsy people um, in World War II, although it was actually happening beforehand. So some of the premise of what was happening, Gypsies were being uh, documented and sent to essentially work camps from, we've, we've got evidence to show as early as 1934, so it's, uh, it was going on for, for quite some time beforehand, but um, some, some numbers have been put to close to a million, but 500,000 we can definitely count. So I mentioned we had Rodney Gypsy Smith, so we're touching into a little bit of church history here. It had gone kind of quiet for that 50 years. We'd had two world wars, there wasn't, you know, there was a lot of uh, displacement. But when we go into 1950s France, and this is, um, um, this is where the tide changes. So we get the, uh, what we class as the, the French Revival. And uh, in the, when we say in the tents, there was marquees, and obviously gypsies would often gather within, um, within say, uh, particular fields and, and, and together because obviously safety in numbers um, and the revival started uh, as, as we've got documented within within France and from that uh, it was a I uh, should mention it was a v evangelical Pentecostal revival that uh, was that was really the sort of the, if you want to know the uh, essentially the ecclesiological backing behind it it was a uh, evangelical Pentecostalism um, that eventually spread to 1980s England where you might have heard of a, a church route called light and life um, and so that was, you know, born born from that movement. Um, skip forward again to that, that, although that still was a movement within, probably I'd say, um, perhaps Jonathan would, uh, you know, ears on the ground would perhaps know, know better on this. Um, I'd, I'd say probably towards the, the late noughties that um, there was probably more of a move among gypsies and travellers into you know, sort of more sort of freer churches and things like that, rather than specifically, you know, a continual growth of, of independent 
just purely gypsy bread uh, led churches, although they were still growing. Um, then go forward to 2019, General Synod. Uh, there was a commitment to stand up against racism and discrimination against GRT people, which included having a GRT chaplain in every diocese in the country. Um, and then, really, that's, uh, that's, that's our history up until that point. Unless you can count 2020, I'm going to put myself on this one, although it's really bad, isn't it, to do that. Um, I became the first person of Romany Gypsy heritage in the UK to be awarded a PhD in theology in 2020, which, although I'm proud of that, it upsets me that I was. It upsets me. It took till 2020 for something like it. It's, that, that's a reminder for, for, of the pain on that so i'm sure you can appreciate it so to summarize the origins of grt church grt christians went from being treated by the church as unintelligent and deviant modern lepers and that's a quote uh, in the 19th century to forming their own churches in the 20th century across uh, europe and the americas uh, a revival started in French tents and camps in the 1950s and spread to the UK during the 1980s and saw GRT people building their own pulpits and ad adopting evangelical Pentecostalism en masse. Um, and whilst many gypsies and travellers continue to attend and or use traditional denominational places of worship, the changed theological and ecclesiological outlook among much of the community is one that cannot be and should not be uh, ignored or dismissed. Okay. That's a really great interview, isn't it? <laughs> and on that note... <laughs> I mean, don't, um, don't get me wrong, I'm getting stuck into something here, but it's, um, I don't know if it's that dramatic. I feel like I've, I've got to live up to the organ now. Right, okay, are we still, still with it? Yes, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. brilliant, right. Fighting prejudice with faith. You'll see where I'm going with this in a moment. Okay, so we've heard how gypsies, Roma and travellers came to be an identifiable and unique people. And how in their myriad of tribes and collectives, they were the subject of an historical nar narrative that is painful to hear and scarring to live through. But we've also heard how faith-filled tenacity and resilience, combined with an unashamed and unbridled love for Christ, can be the catalyst to revival. Revival, Christian church revival, is often broadly understood as the expansion of God's kingdom here on earth. Um, but too often, we change how the expansion of God's kingdom, or revival, is measured. We've placed numbers as our value instead of numbering our values. And yes, kingdom expansion can and often does look like more people through church doors. But kingdom expansion, as we've heard with the Micah Project and with Ignite, it more often than not looks like a meal for the needy, um, a kind word for a stranger, a heart of compassion from one community to another. And I would suggest that we stop understanding Christian revival just as a grand outcome of a movement of God and instead committing to understand revival as the daily heartbeat and actions of the church. And when we see revival in this way, we stop relying on God to bring about change and instead we pursue change and righteous outcomes ourselves, knowing that in faith, God deals what, with what is impossible for man whilst we do what is possible by man. And yes, of course, we pray. But I challenge you today, this evening, make your prayer look like something. Make your prayer look like action. Make your prayer look like justice. Make your prayer look like the dismantling of unfair structures like the ones we've heard of. Make your prayer look like a fight against prejudice. If too long, victims of prejudice in whatever form they dwell in have had to provide explanations behind their actions, their thoughts, and if applicable, even their culture. Let me reassure you though, providing explanations in that way is markedly different to offering understanding as hopefully we're doing this evening especially when prejudice is ready to pounce. Revival, or as we've just discussed, the daily act of faith in practice, it must include dismantling harmful stereotypes and demolishing dangerous prejudices. And whilst it's true that some prejudices that we as individuals hold are helpful in that they can keep us safe in certain circumstances, it's also true that many prejudices are unhelpful and have been learnt through certain failings in our own unique cultures, communities, and perhaps even our upbringing. 
And please don't misunderstand me, this is not in any way an attack against our national church and more ecumenically speaking the entire Christian body. But listen carefully. It is a necessary moment of conviction for those who profess to love and serve Christ. Furthermore, it is a warning to those who harbour power whilst refusing to walk in righteousness. If we refuse to support and genuinely love on and engage those on in the margins, in the edgelands, and in the shadows, the poor, then it will not be the poor that fail, but those who pass judgment from lofty positions. Mark my words, the church will be saved by the poor. So fighting prejudice with faith becomes part of our practice, an element in our revival. Taking down harmful stereotypes and unwanted prejudice was once the heart of a God-fearing man who so famously told us, I have a dream. Martin Luther King dreamt of an equal playing field where all of God's creation was recognised in the fullness in which it was created. Many GRT people, so often victims of unchallenged racism and unchecked hatred, have held similar dreams. These GRT people are wanting what every free person upon this earth desires and deserves an autonomy of person and equal standing among his fellow man. But from Gorgia society, or non-GRT people, this requires genuine love, genuine engagement and genuine openness. Now listen carefully. Gypsies, Roma and travellers are not a coat in the closet that hangs up and around until you're ready to welcome them. I'm going to say that again, not only because it's impactful, but because there's a really loud organ. <laughs> Gypsies, Roma and travellers are not a coat in the closet that hangs around until you're ready to welcome them. Genuine love takes courage, going against the grain and standing up to the so-called last acceptable racism of hating on GRT people. It takes courage, genuine love for those whom your culture, community or group says it's okay to hate. Genuine love for those people? It's not weakness to love those who might reject you. It's vulnerability, and vulnerability takes courage. Courage requires strength, and strength requires tough people, tough or resilient people. They're not dangerous. Weak people are dangerous. Weak people cannot stand up to evil. They cannot be virtuous. They cannot protect others. And so the evils of prejudice and racism will be, and is, unopposed to them. It's a turning of the tables. Think about certain things in our political system. The people who are perhaps in power at certain times, I'm not naming names. That, that's weakness. And what we're asking for is courage and toughness. Christ requires us to pick up our cross every day. And that takes strength, that takes courage. It takes resilience. And let's be clear, we need strength and courage when it comes to openly welcoming the stranger into our midst, be it in our community or in our congregation. In particular, generational opposition to GRT communities goes back centuries, and that's a lot to overcome and conquer. So in paving the way for the marginalised, some people, often those with good intentions, head straight to the low-hanging fruit of offence. It seems obvious and at times an easy win. After all, when someone calls all travellers dirty, accuses all Roma of being thieves, or when a millionaire comedian online suggests that gypsies dying in the Holocaust was a good thing, it's easy to take these people down. But as someone who has directly experienced offence in this manner, I would suggest caution in stopping those who run their tongue and label their hate in giant neon letters. As by their fruit you will know them, Cut the fruit off and suddenly the wolf of racism returns to sheep's clothing. See, unbridled free speech is not only the friend of the free, it's the lighthouse for the vulnerable. Let me say that again. Unbridled free speech is not only a friend of the free, it's the lighthouse for the vulnerable. GRT people know who hates them. They're told every day, through words on school playgrounds, in newspaper headlines, by the actions of parts of Middle England and through the policies of a government hell-bent on eradicating gypsy culture. Who hates you? Who, who opposes you here? If you were stood in a room now with a hundred other people and one of them posed a threat to you, wouldn't you A, 
like to know who that person is, and B, like to have every other person in that room able to reject that hatred. As someone who was boxed, quite literally boxed, let me assure you, no one has ever won a fight of shadow boxing. Hitting and taking down what you can't touch isn't possible. So when we want to love on others with strength and courage, in the spirit of revival level faithful practice, we need to mostly aim high. A friend of mine who lives in a nearby village told me of a group of travellers who arrived on the village green where she lived. Uh, the reaction was sadly typical. Conversation in the local pub revolved around the unwelcome visitors with discussions taking place on how to move them off and away in the shortest amount of time possible. Meanwhile, an instant and worryingly automatic decision to refuse to serve or sell to the travellers both in the pub and the post office came into effect immediately. As the sun went down, locals would hold their car horns on as they drove past the travellers. If the travellers were staying there, the locals were going to ensure they weren't going to sleep. My friend was rightfully concerned for a number of reasons, and she phoned me for some advice. That afternoon, she headed over to the three or four caravans, or trailers as we called them. They were a few hundred metres from her house, and she introduced herself. She offered them a warm drink and said if they needed water, they could use her outside tap. They had a nice chat and the visitors appreciated her welcome. They asked if they could buy some black bags from her to, for their rubbish and they reassured her that even though she didn't ask that they'd be gone by the end of the week. We're trying to find a school for the Littlelands, they told her, but we can't put them in a school until we find somewhere we're allowed to stop and stay for a proper amount of time. <coughs> My friend checked for a little while longer and then headed back to her house. And that night, she was woken by the sound of sirens. Police were in attendance along with a fire engine. They've obviously been kicking off typical jippos, said my friend's neighbour. As the sun rose the next day, the truth of what summoned the emergency services became a little clearer. One of the caravans was covered in graffiti and a couple of the windows smashed out. Perhaps more ominously were the three or four petrol cans left by each of the caravans. The police had confirmed that thankfully the cans were empty, but the message from the locals was clear. That afternoon the travellers moved on. Laws and regulations regarding stopping places and private property serve, can serve purposes. The villagers serve themselves. However, my friends serve people. Listen carefully. Serving purposes, serving ourselves, and then possibly serving others produces the outcome we just heard. But if we first serve others, we end up serving ourselves, which then ultimately serves many purposes. A quick example could be volunteering in a charity shop. We start by helping someone else. This helps our mood, which results in the charity being perhaps more profitable. Lower income individuals get access to cheaper goods and our mental health potentially improves. What would happen, what would have happened and what the response been had the whole village responded as my friend did? If the stranger had been welcomed, well, for a start, three generations under the same roof, grandparents, parents and children, wouldn't have all been branded criminals and deviants by the kangaroo court of the village. My book addresses stereotypes such as these, and whilst I offer different perspectives, I would say that for here and now, that to, to demolish stereotypes, we must first start by fighting prejudice with faith. If we don't engage in a revival of genuine love towards those our societies consider less than, the poor, we mustn't be surprised when God hands over the reins of his church to the poor. The poor will save the church in one way or another, the writings on the wall. It's up to the majority to decide whether they expand the current table of welcome now or risk being asked to leave the table later. For gypsies and travellers, Often your word and promise is as good as any contract, a handshake as binding as any legal agreement. In short, actions speak louder than words. Greater inclusivity for GRT people from the church on one hand might be demonstrated by representation in key positions and by a collective welcoming to the table of theological debates and ecclesiological matters. Well done, Liverpool Cathedral. However, on the other hand, it will be de demonstrated by open invitations to communities and parishes without expectations or demand. And it will be fueled by sincere change in the hearts and minds of both clergy and parishioners. 
the standard for inclusivity in our society, even when emerging from the sincerest of intentions, has in many situations sometimes been reduced to flag waving, profile picture frames and virtual signaling in a myriad of forms. Our corporations and our institutions will proudly and loudly and seemingly annually announce their allegiances to those it believes to be occupying the margins. And whilst awareness is a powerful tool in inst instigating change, many are waking up to the reality that the loudest voices rarely venture out of their gated communities to walk among those who are suffering. Our standard as Christians, our standard as the church, must be higher than the world. It must be higher than those outside these doors. Our standard as Christians, demonstrated by Jesus himself, is, was, and always should be love. Family with all its highs and lows looks like love. Welcoming the stranger to our table looks like love. Giving looks can look like love. And I mean that from the opposite way. I know what a bad look looks like. Hope, acceptance and serving others looks like love. If you were to ask me what a more inclusive approach to GRT people would look like from the church in the UK, now and in the future, I would say that it looks like love. It looks like Jesus. Thank you. <laughs>